All right, let's get going with death and burial, this time in Rome. So, just like I said before in the Greek video, there are four aspects to both the Greek and Roman studies of death and burial. One, preparation of the body. Two, the funerary procession. Three, the burial of the body. And four, festivals for the dead and the ancestors. And just like with the Greek study, we look at two Roman festivals for the dead. Both cultures felt that remembering the dead was incredibly important and they put a lot of focus on the rituals associated with death and burial. So we're going to be going through those rituals again. So with Rome, just like in Greece, with the preparation of the body, the Romans believed that everyone should have a proper burial. In the first century AD, the author Pliny the Younger wrote to a friend about a ghost that was haunting a house. And this story was used then to show that there were consequences to lack of burial. Now, having studied the journey to the underworld already in our class, we know that you need to be buried in order to get to the underworld. Without having been buried, you are going to be stuck on the side of the river Styx for 100 years before Chiron will even think about ferrying you to the other side. Now, this ghost story is one of these ones where, yeah, it totally happened to a friend of a friend, yeah. But there were lots of these sorts of stories. So here is Pliny's story. Um, he talks about how his friend had been awakened by a clanking of chains. And when he went to investigate in his new house, he saw the spectre of an old man in uh, sort of shredded robes and chains attached to his arms and legs. He says nothing but wanders to a specific place in the house and then disappears. So Pliny picks up the story. The next day we went to the magistrates and advised them to order that spot, the spot that the ghost had stopped on, to be dug up. There they found bones commingled and intertwined with chains, for the body had rotted away due to lying so long in the ground, leaving them bare and corroded by the fetters, the chains that bound the body. The bones were collected and buried at the public expense, and after the ghost was thus duly laid, the house was haunted no more. So this idea was that uh, this poor chap, as you can see in this much, much later and not Roman illustration of this story, where the ghost is appearing to Athenodorus, this friend Pliny, uh, at, at night while he's late writing. Um, you can sort of see that he really just wants to be buried. He's been chained up. His body has been buried in a place without any way of anyone knowing it's there. He has not been given a proper burial. And so once this ghost asks for a proper burial, he doesn't come back. It might sound a bit ungrateful, but you'd probably be very grateful not to be haunted again. It's also thought that this particular story was uh, possibly one of the things that inspired Charles Dickens when writing the Ghost of Marley scene in A Christmas Carol. So the Romans, we know, were very, very superstitious. If you've studied the Cambridge Latin course, book one, you'll know that they believed in ghosts and werewolves, shape changers, and they believed that ghosts could all actually kill you. And they believed in this life after death, going to the afterlife and needing to be buried in order to get there. So this image, this is a mosaic from Pompeii and it dates from somewhere between 30 BCE and 14 CE. We're not entirely sure, but you can see it's very, very detailed and it's very, very symbolic. So first of all, working from top to bottom, that wooden thing with the yellowy things and lots of sort of screws on it, that is a level, a libella. You use that in order to help you, you know, build a house, get the right at angles and stuff. We would think of it as a protractor. It's uh, also got a plumb line, that thing hanging down from it there. That's the bit that keeps the level straight. And the plumb line is, in fact, uh, instead of just a, a lead weight, here we've also got a skull, which signifies death. Yes, I know it looks a bit like a monkey. Move past that. And then underneath that, we've got a butterfly, which represented the soul. It's very poetic. And then underneath that, we've got a wheel. And the wheel represents fortune or chance. There was even a TV show years ago called Wheel of Fortune. Spin the wheel, see where it gets you. And you might see that at the fair. But this idea that the wheel spins and you don't know where it will end up. The wheel is not broken, by the way. The mosaic is somewhat um, smashed in the middle there. So 
either side of this plumb line, which keeps the level straight, which has got the death and the soul and fortune and chance, we've got on the left hand side symbols of wealth and power. At the top there we've got a scepter, sort of a stick of office that you might carry if you were important. And underneath that we've got some purple cloth. And purple was a very expensive dye and only owned by the wealthy. In fact, purple was the colour that denoted people who had magistracies. Senators got to wear purple, for example. Then on the other side we've got symbols of poverty. We've got a scrip, which is a beggar's pouch. Kind of like those little pouches that go on the end of a walking stick. You know, you see those in the old pictures of Dick Whittington. And then underneath that, instead of a nice purple cloth, we've got burlap sacking. You know, though only the very, very poor would, re would wear these because it's not very comfortable and, it, and it's free. It's basically recycling. So that's got poverty on that side. So the level is being kept in perfect balance by these symbols or vice versa these symbols are being kept in perfect balance by these things which happen to everybody everyone dies everyone has a soul the bit that goes to the afterlife and everyone suffers on the wheel of fortune because you don't know what fortune has in store for you you might have good fortune and have nice things happen to you you might have bad things happen to you and have bad fortune and those things could cause you to be wealthy and have power or they could you know, lead you to end up a beggar dressed in burlap sacking. So the theme of this particular image, which decorates this house, is is meant to remind the diners who are looking at it, because this is in the triclinium, as it says below, that um, earthly fortune is fleeting. So enjoy it while it lasts. So preparation of the body. Now, in order to be really clear, I've marked sections of these following slides with yellow to show where there are differences to the Greek practice. You should still write down both, but you might want to highlight the bits that are different. Often it's much harder to remember the bits that are different than it is to remember the bits that were the same. So, preparation of the body. Once a person had died, the eyes and mouths were closed. And for the Romans, they took the last breath with a kiss. This was more symbolic than anything else, but the idea that the breath would sort of live on and not be wasted. Now, this is new for the Romans. Those present at the death or at the moment of death or, or those who were there just after death, they call out the deceased's name. If no one's been there while the deceased has died, this is then done ceremonially afterwards. Then, just like the Greeks, the body's washed and perfumed, but this time, instead of dressing them in a shroud, as the Greeks did, the body would be buried by the Romans in its finest clothes. This idea of status was much more important to the Romans, as we'll see. A coin is then placed in the body's mouth, payment for car on the ferryman in the underworld, and as the Greeks and Romans had the same ideas about that, that is the same. And then we get to the laying out of the body. So similarly, you lay out the body in order for people to come and visit. Slightly differently here, if you have a, a home with an atrium, the main hall of the home, that is where the Romans would put the dead. Normally that's for the moderately wealthy to much more wealthy people. If they were poor and lived in a flat, an insula, as a lot of people did, uh, if you walk around Pompeii you'll see that a lot of the buildings are indeed made up of small buildings. And if you go to Herculaneum they've actually been able to show several floors there. Sometimes there might not have been a separate room for this, but people do need to still come and pay their respects to the body. So this time, this period lasts for eight days, allowing mourners, familia and clientes to come and pay their respects. Now those words in italics, familia and clientes, are Latin. Familia, you can probably guess, means family. They generally lived in their extended families, but they might have family come to visit. This other word, clientes, you might recognise just like the English word client. Um, the Romans had this interesting relationship with their ex-slaves and people that perhaps they'd be able to loan money to. If you were wealthy enough to be able to free slaves and loan money to people, you would be a patron and the people that you helped out were your clientes or clients. Now, they had to do something in return for you and that was generally show up at your house every morning and accompany you to the forum as your entourage. Again, it's that show of status. So if your patron dies, you as the client, you need to go and pay your respects to the dead.
We also have at this time, just like in Greece, the women of the house lamenting, and they lament this whole time, and they wail next to the body, beating their chests in particular seems to be a more Roman way of mourning the dead. So here we have two sections of sarcophagi. Sarcophagi are stone coffins. Um, it actually means flesh eating, which is delightful, isn't it? Um, and on the sides of these sarcophagi, we've got carved relief panels. And these depict the laying out of the body in the atrium with mourners and attendants. So they're really useful to us to show us exactly what would be happening there. You might think, gosh, that's a bit weird. It's a sarcophagus for burying people in. So they've put a picture of burying people on it. Yeah, but it's, let's just not overlook the fact that it's really, really useful to us. So if we look at them on the top here, which we can see the whole long side. Going from the top to the bottom here, we've got a very popular Roman motif. We've got bull skulls, bucrania, which represent sort of sacrifices. And we've also got swags of fruit and corn, uh, sort of symbols of plenty. We've got them all along the side. And then on the corners, we've got theatre masks. As you can see, they're very exaggerated faces with a specific sort of shaped mouth. These are meant to ward off evil. There's a special word for this. They are apotropaic symbols. I'll talk about that another time. Then coming down to the main scene, which you can immediately recognise if you've looked through the Greek video, we've got the dead person on a couch. We've got the chief mourner sitting at the head there. Actually, it could be either, either of them there, but normally it's the one at the head, we think. Uh, we've got more mourners, and if they're veiled, they tend to be women. And we've also got the family pet underneath there and what looks like um, the dead person's shoes <laughs> on, a, on a cushion, perhaps, as well. Um, we've also got, again, this idea of arms sort of raised in mourning or a prayer gesture. Although, to be honest, some of them just look really, really fed up rather than sad. Um, looking at this bottom image, we've got here again, the body is being placed on the couch. And it's possible here that we're seeing the kiss and the closing of the eyes, that ritual that is done uh, when the dead person's soul has departed their body. We've also got the possessions of this dead man. We've got their dog looking very small and puppy like and very sweet. And next to the dog on the right, we've got their armour. In fact, we can really see in front there their helmet. They were a soldier. So these are objects that represent their life, which is quite important for showing on the side of the sarcophagus. I rather like this image because this poor chief mourner really shows how much grief they feel as they can't even bear to look at their dead loved one being laid out on the couch. So to continue on with the funerary procession, this time it is called the pompa, which means procession. Again, the yellow show differences to Greek practice. So this time, the funerary procession takes place after the eighth day of mourning. The procession leads from the house of the deceased to the burial ground. That much is the same. The Greeks and Romans both believed that you could not bury people within the city because it would pollute the city. It would create miasma. So there is a procession that takes them to the burial ground, which is outside the city. Now, to get there, the deceased would be carried by wagon or by pallbearers, depending on the wealth of the family. And that, again, is very, very similar to Greece. And the procession included women whose job it was to mourn and children and men from the family. But this time you also add to that the slaves, the freedmen and any other clientes that weren't necessarily just freedmen, ex-slaves. So you've got a much bigger potential group who are adding to the procession also got musicians, this time flute and horn players accompanying the procession and possibly still some Aulos players too. And here's where it gets very different. Members of the family carried or wore funerary masks. The Latin word for this is imagines, kind of like the word imagine. You imagine what they looked like by looking at the imagines. These are masks of family ancestors, so previously dead members of the family, and they're made of wax. And these are to symbolise the acceptance of the deceased 
into the afterlife by their ancestors. It's almost like your ancestors going, yes, welcome to the dead side of the family, my child. And the idea was that these were made after the death of the person with wax pressed to the face to get an actual representation of the face. These were really useful. They could be used later to make busts, for example, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, this did actually continue as a practice, I believe, well into the 19th century, maybe even the early 20th century, death masks made of famous characters and they were turned into busts later on and you could buy them, you know, buy, buy a bust of someone that you greatly admired. Wealthy families would also hire professional mourners and even actors to mimic the deceased as they were in life. Obviously, that's going to take a lot more money. Um, in the funeral of Julius Caesar, um, the, the later great dictator for life of Rome, who didn't unfortunately come to a very good end, at his funeral, there were actors who were dressed to portray him and also actors even to portray the places that he'd conquered on behalf of Rome. And they were there to sort of play with the emotions of the viewers of the funeral, although there was a particular reason for that. Mark Antony was trying to get his own way. But... This idea here was you're really, really showing off the life of the person who died. Now, these days, the kind of things that we might do that are a bit like that are, you know, put up pictures of the deceased, maybe show videos of the deceased, maybe even show a video recorded by the deceased before they died. So even though this might seem a little bit creepy to us, it probably isn't when we look at it closely. So here is another stone sarcophagus with another carved relief. And looking in the middle there, you can probably immediately see the main focus is the body on the couch on a beer. Now this, a beer, is something that you use to carry the deceased and note the spelling, B-I-E-R. Normally it's a platform with then long poles going through it that go on the shoulders of the pallbearers, who are those people along the other side. And note here, it's not that there are some short pallbearers and some tall pallbearers. I think the idea here is possibly that there are, maybe they're the younger members, or it could be that this is an attempt at doing some kind of perspective. In any case, they are carrying the body that is still on the couch, and this is part of the procession. Um, you see, there's a lot of pallbearers needed for that, so that would be very showy-offy. Now, looking at the other groups of characters, we've got what well, is probably a family group because we've got children and a woman, so this may well be the funeral of the, the husband, the father in their family. But then we've got lots of other people who look in various stages of grief. So possibly up in this corner, we've got all these women here who might well be paid mourners. And in front here, we've also got people doing some really quite dramatic movements. They may well be actors playing the deceased. And in front here, to get everyone's attention as the procession moves through town, we've got musicians, horns and tuba, and musicians playing the aulos, or possibly the diaulos. There's some debate over what that's called. And right at the back there, you might see a very, very small person. It could be a child, but not entirely sure. Now, I told you about these masks, right? So um, on the far right here, this is a stone relief. And it's meant to show a mask or a bust that's been made from a mask in a cupboard. So the mask is called the imagines. Oh, sorry. Um, well, plural masks is imagines. And the cupboard is the armaria. And then these are examples of not Roman, by the way, but wax death masks. So you can see by the fact that the eyes are closed, that they're meant to be taken after death. And they're quite lifelike and, and yes, a little bit creepy, I can imagine as well. But so can you imagine now, please, a procession where lots of the people in the procession are carrying these? Yeah. Now, this is a statue uh, called the Togatus Barberini and it's in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. This may represent a senator holding two ancestral funerary portraits, imagines. And these look like they're actually marble busts rather than actually wax, but they would have been carved using the imagines as a reference. The burial of the body. Again, the yellow is differences to Greek practice. 
So, as before, this had to happen outside the city to avoid any religious pollution falling on the city itself. This was also practical, as it stopped the spread of disease. And in Roman towns, just as in Greek towns, burials were made outside the walls. So, the wealthy were buried alongside the roads leading to and from the city to allow passers-by to pay their respect. And it was really obvious where they were buried. The poor, we don't always know where they were buried because their graves just don't really last. And we'll see why later on. Once the body reached this ground, it would be buried or cremated in the same tradition as the Greeks. But um, there are different sort of fashions that seem to have occurred, which involve those sarcophagi that we saw earlier. This is a slightly pixelated, sorry, um, photograph from Pompeii in pictures. And it shows one of the roads leading out of Rome. Uh, This is the Herculaneum Gate exit. And this is part of the necropolis, which means city of the dead. Necropolis is basically another way of, we might say, a graveyard or a cemetery. And you can see here that the road going in and out of the city is lined with tombs. All of these structures are tombs. There are big ones. There are ruined ones. There's one on the left there, which is actually some seats. So you could go and hang out there. There's ones on the right there. That one looks like a big stone box. Another one looks like uh, an entrance way to a house. You can imagine that there's lots of different fashions here. If you were to go these days to a really old Victorian graveyard, like the big ones in London or even on the outskirts of London, you would find these old tombs often look quite different. You might think that's quite surprising. It's a tomb. It's a box that you put the dead people in. But they went through fashions. They went through designs. It was important to maybe have lots of detail. Sometimes it's important to have not so much detail. So those are meant to stand out and be able to show off the wealth and status of the dead person. These are not poor tombs. So the family's wealth decides the size of the tomb. And this is very different to to the Greek tradition. So with wealthy tombs, as we saw in that image of the necropolis outside the Herculaneum Gate, a family tomb or even an individual tomb along the roadside would generally be a sign that the family had been wealthy. Tombs might even include areas for sitting and eating dinner with the dead, or they might include elaborate sarcophagi. Note that the body is normally placed inside something that is placed inside the sarcophagi, all right, so not directly inside the stone. Um, Sometimes you might have funerary urns in which the ashes of the cremated were placed. They were gradually overtaken in popularity by the stone sarcophagus as inhumation became more common. Inhumation is the burial of the body without cremation. Um, That's really quite popular still today, although cremation is becoming even more popular again. Um, So... These sarcophagi, as we have already seen, were often decorated with reliefs that tell us a lot about those burial practices. So it could be really useful to us scholars of that area. Poor tombs, however, the urn containing the ashes of the seas might just be buried in the ground. Um, As you needed to feed the dead, sometimes you might put a tube into it that you could pour offerings in. Um, So yeah, there's a big old difference there. Um, To ensure family memories were honoured by those still alive, marble busts were often made that were then placed in the house so that you could walk past and remember them. Uh, As I said before, these marble busts became very popular. You might get one of a famous person to put in your house. And these would have been carved using the imagine as, as reference. Now, you can probably imagine that was probably, again, something that the wealthy had done rather than the poor. The dead turned into manes. Note the the, the, the the italics there show that this is another Latin word. Manes means the deified ancestors. And they needed to be placated by being fed food and wine offerings. So even though the person you had given the funeral for was dead, you did not get rid of them very easily. These spirits of the deified ancestors, deified means turned into a god. Basically, your ancestors, because they've gone into the underworld, you need to practically worship them to stop them coming back and hurting you and to show that you are a pious person. So you can see where we get a lot of our superstitions about the dead coming back and haunting the living and often being really quite painful for the living to have to deal with. 
So here is a little woodcut. I haven't put the reference, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. This uh, is an outdoor dining room that's been colourised next to a tomb. This idea was if you were wealthy enough to have the be able to buy the tomb space and then the space to put an outdoor dining room, you could go and have dinner with your ancestors, perhaps on the anniversary of their death or at uh, some of the funerary style festivals that honoured the dead that we will study later. So you can see that's, that's pretty much like a real dining room, but made of stone and outdoors. You would traipse down there with some slaves and some food and you'd sit there and have a meal and you'd make offerings to the dead probably at the same time. So it'd be like they were joining you. That's a lot of effort to go to. And that would probably not get used all the time. So what is it there for? That's right. It's there for showing off. Everyone would know who this belonged to. Um, these Pompeian tombs, again, are for showing off. We're going to look at two tombs here. Um, they're sort of, they're meant to say sort of house-shaped, a big sort of box with some decorations on. And they generally all have a relief, so a carving and an inscription. So this one, this tomb is quite special. I like this one because it shows a bazillium, a double wide seat, as you can see there. And that was awarded to you for service to the city. Um, that double wide seat would be placed on the bottom level steps at the theatre, for example. And look, it's got a cushion. It's a bit like those really nice VIP seats at the front of the cinema that you have to pay extra for. Um, but the idea here was, as it's in the theatre, you know, everyone goes to the theatre who's anyone and the important people get to sit at the front and the really important people get to sit on a bazillion. So again, this is all about status. So they're quite literally putting on the side of their tomb the, f the greatest honour that they ever had, which was a really nice seat for everyone to look at. We've also got here an inscription, and in this inscription it shows that the dead person held a special priesthood, uh, which was generally for freedmen, um, they were an Augustali, and this shows that he was a freedman, and this was a great honour, um, this was a special, freed, uh, sorry, a special priesthood brought in by the Emperor Augustus in order to make freedmen, ex-slaves, feel a bit more special and loyal to him, he created this priesthood. So this tells us quite a lot, really, that this particular freedman had been able to rise from being a slave to someone so wealthy that they could afford this amazing tomb and who had somehow also been awarded a bazillium in the theatre, which was pretty darn special for a freedman. This next um, tomb, again, it's got that big house shape, they're very highly decorated as well and this is another uh, tomb of uh, a freedman it seems i've replicated the text that goes with this here and added to it this is the tomb of c monartius faustus probably caius monartius faustus this decorative tomb was created by monartius by his wife nivolea whose picture or bust rather carving is at the top here she is portrayed in a representation of a woman looking out through a window at the top of the relief and it talks about her honoring him with this in the inscription so we do know who this is meant to be the idea was that after he died his wife beloved him so much she had this put up with their money um the inscription indicates that Monatius held the title of Augustalis, another one just like on the previous tomb and thus was a very wealthy and respected Pompeian freedman and just in case, because not everyone could read, just in case the person walking past this could not read the inscription, like us today can't necessarily all read Latin, there's a picture of something that shows how great they were. In this scene, we've actually got a relief carving of Monatius and Nivolea giving food to the poor people. Now, considering that lots of those poor people might actually have been citizens and thus technically sort of higher status than freedmen who were ex-slaves, that's a big deal. That really shows off this status. And this would leave no doubt in the viewer's mind that Monatis was noble, wealthy and loved by the people. This is a fragment of from a sarcophagus again a very high relief they're practically statues this is just the corner of one side as you can see it kind of goes round there diagonally and this is meant to depict the stages of the deceased person's life they have um 
on the left there, uh, perhaps a religious initiation. Then we can see them wearing military garb and this shows their military service. And then the next image of the deceased, it's him and a woman and this is meant to show their wedding. And you can just imagine the rest of the scenes that might have continued on. It's quite literally the walk of life. This person's whole life carved all the way around their tomb. And this would have been on show somewhere with the deceased remains tucked neatly away inside. But wow, what fabulous detail on here that's going to cost an awful lot to have made and that would certainly have showed off their status now a less poor moderately wealthy burial cremation urns so the ashes of the dead would be buried in these urns if you aren't wealthy you're not going to be able to inhume a body have a sarcophagus made and put the whole body in it and find somewhere to show it off you need somewhere smaller so cremation was still generally popular with the poorer people or moderately wealthy um although before sarcophaguses became very popular lots of people would have been cremated so as you see with the one on the left here that's not for a poor person so the ashes of the dead would be buried in these uh, uh, urns <laughs> trying to convert put the word jars and urns together in one go. Urn is a jar, right? And it's got a, a stopper in the top. And depending on the wealth of the family, you will note that that phrase has come up a lot. That is what would depend, tell us what the material was, that the urn was made of, right? I think we got to the end of that now. So on the left hand here, we've got a hand-carved blue and white glass urn from Pompeii found near the Herculaneum Gate, like we saw before, and it's now in the Naples Museum. Yes, it's glass. It's amazing. Don't ask me how they made it. Go and look it up online. It is stunning and it is beautiful and it is highly, highly detailed and my goodness, we're amazed it survived. So that might have been placed in a tomb rather than being, as the ones at the bottom here, these clay urns, shoved in the ground. So if you were poor, you couldn't really afford a tomb to put an urn inside. So you might be buried in an old oil jar, for example, your ashes placed in there, and you might be put in the ground. Um, on this next slide, we see here um, a grave that I was lucky enough to find in the museum at Caerleon in Wales. This is uh, from a British grave, obviously. It's in, well, I say British, UK grave. Um, and this is from Roman times, and it's a very poor burial. This urn is quite simply a lead jar that would have been used for something else, it seems. And it's buried in the earth. It's It's got bricks laid over it. And you can see the feeding tube being propped out of it to allow for food offerings to be put inside it. It's very rough looking. It's not decorative at all. You'd barely even notice that from passing by. So you can really start to see the difference between wealth and status of the deceased and complete lack thereof of wealth or status of the poor deceased. And that's why when we look at these graves, we tend to only look at the graves of the rich because the graves of the poor just quite simply don't always exist to us at least anymore. Now, this is something that isn't Greek at all. This is a Roman practice, the funeral clubs. As death was so important in Roman culture, most of our information about Roman burial comes from the lavish and detailed burial monuments of the rich, as we've seen and as I was just saying. But working class citizens and freedmen did not always have the money for such lavish funeral practices. And so they formed funeral clubs. Now, we might recognise this as a bit like when you pay insurance just in case something happens. If that thing then happens, your family get a payout in order to deal with the circumstances. And that's exactly what this is. Those who could afford to would pay a monthly subscription to join a club. So it's like your monthly monthly or quarterly in uh, um, fee to the insurance companies. If you're not sure about insurance, ask your parents, right? They definitely pay insurance on something. Then the club would meet for meals and gatherings. So it also acted as a social club. These people would be your friends. And uh, often we got workers of the same trade setting up clubs together, such as the Baker's Guild and the Blacksmith's Guild. And there's also evidence of gladiators doing the same thing. Just a quick note. 
an awful lot of gladiators were not slaves originally. They were people who had actually paid, or rather been paid, to sell themselves into slavery. It was a way out of poverty, and for some people it was a way into a much more glamorous life. And they would typically sell themselves into this type of slavery for, say, five years, and should they survive they would buy themselves back. Um, so if they had to do it to get out of poverty, you can imagine they've got a high risk of death. They're likely to die. They would want to be part of a funeral club because mostly if they had that, it's because they also had families and they needed to provide for their families too. Upon the death of a member, the club would pay for a funeral and mourners to ensure that the deceased had a good send off and was not forgotten. That's how important it is for them to be able to get over the river sticks and into the underworld proper. Some burial clubs had tombs or burial grounds for burial of members. So you might find that there is a tomb which has members of completely different families in it because they club together to buy the tomb and then will be able to be placed inside it. So funeral clubs, a bit like insurance for your death. Now, we get finally on to the festivals for the dead and the ancestors who are also dead. This particular one is the Parentalia. Yes, it's got the word parent in it. This was over nine days between the 13th and the 21st of February. During this time, temples were closed, people could not marry, no official business could take place at all. Think of it as being the equivalent of an extended bank holiday when everything important is shut. The festival was intended to honour the dead, the manes, we talked about them earlier, the remainers, those who sort of the ghosts remained and possibly haunted us. So on day one, a blood sacrifice was made by a Vestal Virgin. You should know who the Vestal Virgins are by now. And then between days two and days eight, the festival was largely done at home, being domestic. And at your home, you would make offerings to the dead, your own ancestors. So it quite, becomes quite a private affair. On day nine, the last day, the family would meet and share a meal in the home. And this would allow them to undo any wrongs that had taken place. So it's kind of like a meal so that any grudges you've got can be laid to rest. And any particular problems you've got between family members, you need to get them sorted out. It's a bit like Christmas. <laughs> um, so the idea is that you go forward from this point without anything, and without any bad blood, without any arguments between your family. Because, you know, just in case you die, you don't really want to die having just had an argument with someone. That would make everyone feel absolutely terrible. So for this, we're going to look at a piece of Ovid's Fasti. The poet Ovid wrote a book of days, the Fasti, which tells us all about lots and lots of festivals that were important to the Romans. And in his description here that seems to suggest uh, the, why we do the parentalia, why the Romans did the parentalia, he says that their shades, the dead, you know, a shade, a shadow, a ghost, they ask little. Pietas they prefer to costly offerings. No greedy deities haunt the Stygian depths. A tile wreathed round with garlands offered is enough. A scattering of meal and a few grains of salt and bread soaked in wine and loose violets. That yeah, doesn't sound like much. So just to go through this, in case you want to make any note, all the shades here are asking for is pietas, a bit of piety. Being pious, again, is when you treat the gods the correct way. And remember, the manes are deified ancestors. They've gone up here. So basically, they just ask for correct behaviour. No greedy deities haunt the Stygian depths. Stygian is, is the adjective that describes things being of the sticks of the underworld. A tile wreathed round with garlands. Well, a funeral offering, some kind of marker, a steely, uh, an urn, with floral wreaths, garlands. Those seem, seem to be suggested as being important at any festival. And we did see them on the side of that first sarcophagus we looked at. A scattering of meal, so wheat or grain, you know, that is a traditional offering. It's done in sacrifices as well. A few grains of salt. Salt was a very expensive thing for a lot of people, but it was very, very useful as it was also a purifying element. You could keep uh, food lasting much longer if you rubbed salt into it. And bread soaked in wine. Bread was the main food, the staple of the diet. Wine was their staple drink, and it was also used in celebration. And to the dead, it actually represents blood, which those of you who are Christians and go to Mass might recognise as well. And finally, loose violets. 
well, it's a pretty and delicate flower with a nice smell. And he seems to believe, does Ovid, that of that loose violets, these flowers were particularly lovely on a grave. Uh, they didn't believe in using um, the same kind of flowers that we tend to use at funerals, which tend to be lilies. In fact, lily, I think, for them was a love flower. Uh, roses were more likely to be used as a death flower. So basically, Ovid here is listing the basic needs, and I'm going to list them for you below here. The dead aren't greedy and have few needs, but you do need to give them these needs to be pious. A grave mark with garnets, some corn, some salt, bread soaked in wine and violet flowers. That's all they want, really. So you can imagine during the Parentalia, these being made as offerings. The second festival for the dead and ancestors of Rome that we're going to look at is the Lemuria. Ooh. So this was three days in May, the 9th, the 11th and the 13th of May. They're not consecutive days, note. During this time, temples were closed, people could not marry, no official business could take place. Again, it's like this extended bank holiday kind of thing. And this festival, instead of celebrating the dead, this was to ward off evil spirits that wouldn't leave you alone. Lemures. And I think the small animal called the lima, so called because it has dark eyes and sort of rings around it. I think it's called that because it looks a bit like an evil spirit. So each day during this festival, a ritual was performed that was designed to ward off evil spirits. And again, Ovid describes this in his Fasti. So the poet Ovid tells us that he who remembers ancient rites and fears the gods rises and makes the sign with thumb and closed fingers, lest an insubstantial shade meets him in the silence. Dun, dun, dun. After cleansing his hands in spring water, he turns and first taking some black beans, throws them with an averted face, saying while throwing, with these beans I throw, I redeem me and mine. He says it nine times without looking back. Yes, you might recognise that from other myths. The shade is thought to gather the beans and follow him behind, unseen. Again, he touches water and sounds the bronze cymbals and asks the spirit to leave his house. When nine times he's cried, ancestral spirit, depart, he looks back and believe the sacred rites are fulfilled. Hmm. So let's look at that in detail. So first of all, basically, if you are pious and you respect the gods and thus the dead correctly, you are going to do this ritual. First of all, you make the sign that which wards off ghosts with thumb and closed fingers we're not entirely sure what that sign is but it's a little bit like how in some religions you might do a particular sign with your hand for example christians make the sign of the cross to ward off evil and they do this lest an insubstantial shade meets him in the silence it wards off any ghosts then we have some purification cleansing the hands in spring water that's very important you reduce your miasma your magic here and that's what it is folks magic is going to have much better effect then he turns takes some black beans and throws them now other versions of this that i've read certainly seem to suggest you throw it over one of your particular shoulders and that seems to have translated into a superstition about if you spill salt you're meant to pick some up and throw it over i think your right shoulder without looking um, now, I might be slightly unlucky for anyone standing behind you, but it's meant to stop you from getting any bad luck. It is an apotropaic belief, a warding off against evil. So here, you throw the black beans over your shoulder. Or basically, you throw them with an averted face, so you don't look at where they land. So behind you, you can imagine, is probably where they get thrown. And the idea is this, that while you throw them, you say, with these beans I throw I redeem me and my family. And you have to say that incantation nine times. And the effect of that is, is that the shade is thought to gather the beans and follow you. So that, this is the bit where you're basically distracting the ghosts and sort of calling them to you. They start picking up the beans. Interestingly enough, um, in early Romania, there was a belief that um, if you scattered black beans, ghosts and... Uh, vampires would stop to pick them up because apparently they all have OCD and they wouldn't stop picking them up so if the sun came up they would die whilst picking up these black beans so it's quite a good superstition that seems to have lasted uh, at least in Europe 
Then you do some more purification and you beat bronze. So bronze pots was meant to be pure as well. And this is, I suppose, the equivalent later of like silver bullets for werewolves, that kind of thing. The sound of the bronze is meant to scare off the ghosts. So once you've attracted the ghosts, you then scare them off, right? And you say one more incantation, ancestral spirit, depart. And you say it nine times. And then you're allowed to look back. And when you look back, you won't see any ghosts because, amazingly, the ghosts have gone. They've been exorcised. It's a good thing you didn't look back early and see those ghosts because you might have got too scared because they were totally there. Really, promise. I leave you with this image, which, if you have done the Cambridge Latin course, you will recognise from stage seven, Kenna dinner. Um, it is, again, another triclinium mosaic. A skeleton carrying pitchers, so jugs for drinks. It is from Pompeii, from around the 1st century AC or 1st um, century CE. This is another memento mori, a reminder of death, like the mosaic we saw at the beginning of this video. It's reminding us that death is coming. So enjoy your life while you have it.